Um, I would like to first of all thank um, the Namibian government and most particularly the um, University of Namibia for giving me the privilege of um, participating today in what is the first lecture of the School of Diplomatic Studies of the University of Namibia. It's a great honor for me and I am sure that this will be um, one more activity that Spain can offer to strengthen relations in the academic and international um, field. I would like to um, make a presentation that uh, can offer you uh, a general view of what Spain does in, with um, her African partners and with specific um, references to our bilateral partnership with Namibia. Namibia is a very close partner to our country. We have had um, fruitful and very um, close relationships ever since the um, country's independence in 1990. We established um, diplomatic relations and we opened an embassy. Ever since then, we have had strong development cooperation and strong political ties. We have, we have had high-level visits, among them that of the founder of, of the country, President Didoma, to Spain in, thank you very much, in 1996. Um, and shortly after, 1999, um, the Majesties King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia also came to Namibia on an official visit. Ever since then, there have been other high-ranking officials that have come to Spain and other ministers and high senior officials from Spain that have visited Namibia. And we have, as you will see when I um, start this uh, presentation, we have strong um, economic interests also in Namibia with a strong presence of various economic sectors. And we are also developing uh, strong cooperation in many other fields, amongst them the academic, as we can see, um, um, field. And we have here um, among the um, participants, we have the, the Spanish lecturer that is working here in the University of Namibia to promote the Spanish language. So to start with um, my presentation, I would like first to try and highlight why is our partnership with Namibia and with our African partners important. And I think the best thing to do is to look at a map. It's not the best map I could find, but I think it gives us an idea of what it represents. So here we have a map of the African continent and uh, the southern part of uh, Europe, apart from also the Middle East, but now I'm referring to mostly Europe. You see the proximity. We are the European country that is closest to this continent and actually we share a geographical space because part of our territory and our population is in what we call Africa. So this proximity obviously is already the most important factor for our presence and our close partnership to, to this, um, with the African continent. We share also the um, part of the Mediterranean Sea and the Western Atlantic Ocean, where part of Spain is situated, and most, and most particularly the Las Islas Canarias, the Canary Islands, which are only 100 kilometers from the coast of Africa. Spain has had historical ties also, and long-standing social ties with the African continent, most particularly with the northern countries, the Mediterranean countries, but also with Sub-Saharan Africa, and there is uh, a, a country that not very far away from here, well, which is uh, Equatorial Guinea, which has Spanish as an official language because of our historical ties, but it's the only country where Spain had um, presence during the um, great part of the, um, until its independence, which was obviously in the last century. But it's the only country where Spain um, had a, 
um, the only country in Africa which was a colony, a former colony of Spain. So this is the only country that's why where the Spanish is spoken. And it, it's an advantage in a way because um, it allows um, Spain to have a relation with the rest of the countries in Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, that does not have the baggage sometimes that colonial past can bring. And we have um, tried to reinforce in the, in the last um, decades, most particularly, our partnership with Sub-Saharan Africa by means of different strategies, which were which would we call Plan Africa. We have had three Planes Africa for the moment, and um, the last one was adopted in two, um, 2019, and it is um, a, a strategy for the continent for Sub-Saharan Africa which aims to have a true and equitable partnership with our African partners based on four strategic objectives, which are uh, peace and security, uh, sustainable development and economic growth, strengthening of institutions, and um, promoting safe and orderly um, migration and mobility. Now, this third um, Africa plan, which is adopted in 2019, also has an implementation program, which is um, valid until 2024, with seven goals or seven um, partnerships with our African, um, with the African countries that will enable us to, together with the, the African countries, work together in in for. Um, try to achieve our common interests and defense of those values that we also share. And in most, most um, goals, we have actually, we strive for the same thing, because both Spain and Europe strive for peace and security in the continent, sustainable development um, uh, and economic growth, the strengthening of institutions and respect of human rights, and obviously orderly and safe mobility and respect for the life and the human rights of, of migrants. Um, together with our strategy in, in the African continent, we have also um, increased our diplomatic presence. At the moment in the continent we have 28 embassies and 22 are in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we have also a uh, diplomatic uh, presence and tenors in Gambia and in Chad, and four consulate generals. And then we have um, nine development cooperation offices in, in the continent, in Cape Verde, Ethiopia, Equatorial Guinea, Mali, Mauritania, Mozambique, Niger, Nigeria, and Senegal. And we also have obviously um, commercial, economic and commercial offices at the moment, we I think there are eight. We have just opened, or we're going to open an, uh, an antenna in Douala, Cameroon. And uh, we have defense, labor, migration, and social security offices as well. So I will try to go more into depth. In, and speak about the different um, aspects of our partnership and our different objectives. Um, the first one is linked between security and development. Um, Spain is contributing to, the, um, to peace and security in the continent. We have been doing so for the past decades through only, not only through diplomacy, but also through our um, security and our military participating in European Union um, missions, United Nations missions, and we have also a strong bilateral cooperation in against uh, fighting um, organized crime and um, also all the criminal networks that traffic with, with migrants and other um, illicit, um, and all kinds of illicit products. And we are also very invested in, as I said before, in maritime security. 
But our approach is a holistic approach. We link security, as I said before, to development and to economic growth, to good governance and to humanitarian aid. Because uh, we cannot approach or we cannot help our in the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa if we don't contribute also to address all those structural drivers that um, foster or that breed insecurity and um, all kinds of um, criminality. So uh, we need to address the very the, the, the root causes, and that is the, the best way to do this is to promote um, economic growth, sustainable development, and creating opportunities also for the youth. So we are invested here, we see um, a map of all the, all the missions that Spain is participating in Africa. As we see, we have from the Horn of Africa, we are in Somalia, um, both in the um, Maritime Security Mission of Somalia, where we participate in the European Naval Force to fight piracy on the coast of Somalia. And we're also in two training, uh, military training mission, and um, a civilian mission to fight the terrorism of Al-Shabaab in Somalia. We are in the Sahel. The Sahel is a priority region for Spain because of proximity. And we, we are invested both in Mali and through military operations as in, in Niger. And we also, um, this region is a priority region for us in terms of development cooperation. And um, lastly, in Central and Southern Africa, we are participating in the European training mission in Central um, Republic of, um, of Africa. And in Mozambique, in Cabo Delgado, where you know that there is um, uh, a fight against terrorism. And we also participate in the United Nations mission in the Central Republic of Africa. Um, the first mission that Spain participated abroad in was actually the mission in Namibia in 1990. Uh, the United Nations, um, United Nations Transition Assistance Transition Group to Namibia, and right after the independence, and to allow the celebration of the first um, elections. And this is actually um, something that's very dear to us because it was the first time that our military contributed to working with a partner country in the African continent to help uh, bring peace, security, and stability. Because I must, I, have, I want to highlight um, that everything we do in peace and security is under African leadership. It's um, one of our basic principles is African solutions for African problems. So only working with our partner countries do we, are we able to really contribute to um, missions that can help um, strengthen, um, stabilize, and bring greater peace and security to to these con to these countries? We're now also working with our with partner countries in the um, in the Gulf of Guinea to help them prevent the spread of terrorism. Um, speaking, for example, of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we are helping them to strengthen their own initiatives, like in Ghana there is the ACRA initiative that is headed by, um, by Ghana, and which is an initiative that was um, under the leadership of um, President Kufuado to prevent the spread of terrorism coming down from the Sahel, and mostly for Burkina Faso, because they share a long border with, um, with Burkina Faso, well, um, Togo, uh, Ghana, and um, Cote d'Ivoire. This is the, the, the fight against terrorism because Spain has also bared the brunt of terrorism um, for, long, um, for some period, a long period in, in, our, in our history. And we, it is one of our objectives in peace and security to fight um, terrorism. The second um, um, objective or partnership that we want to reinforce with our with our uh, African partners, and um, this is what is um, stated as well in the program that I spoke about, the program of the government until 2024, is uh, part to contribute to the development of sustainable, just and inclusive economies. And actually, 
great support to African regional integration and the fight against climate change. We had the opportunity to, during our consultations, the very fruitful consultations we had at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to highlight the importance of um, African regional integration. And I'm speaking of um, the different um, regional integration organizations, well, starting from the African Union, but also the other regional organizations such as SADC or ECOWAS or the Eastern African Community or the Central African Community. We believe that um, this should be promoted and, and most particularly also the Great African Initiative, which is the African Free Continental Trade um, um, uh, Area, which is going to be a total game changer. And this is for us something that we would like to support. We are doing it also through the African Union. Spain has a strong partnership with the African Union. And we have an MOU. We have important cooperation. Our minister recently was in Addis in the African Union and contributed with uh, announcing a new contribution of 50 million euros to the Commission of the African Union. Um, and part of this um, contribution will go to support one of the flagship, the great flagship project of the African Union, which is the African Free Continental Trade Area. Um, this will take time. We know it. We are part of the European Union. We know how long it has taken for us. And, um, but it will be a total game changer for the continent in terms of infrastructure as well, of logistics. So um, this is something that we want to partner with and um, also with the African Union, but with every country uh, bilaterally among them um, on Namibia. So in, in terms of um, climate change, this is um, an important um, issue that concerns um, both Spain and Namibia and all, uh, um, all African partners because this is a global challenge and that can only be addressed if we all join efforts. But I just wanted to highlight why this is important for the European Union and for Spain, because um, as I also mentioned during the consultations for us, one of our objectives is to reach um, zero emissions by 2050. And for this, it implies a total overhaul of the European industry and of economic relations and based on our, on our green agenda. And in, you know, in the African continent is an important partner, apart from other reasons, because all these technologies need specific minerals like lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and, um, and these are uh, actually in the African continent is very rich in all these minerals. So this is a strategic asset that the continent has and that we, we Europe also needs for the green agenda and for the transformation of our industry of digitalization and of new technologies. Um, we also have to have in mind the enormous potential that Africa has in renewable energies. This is just an example that um, according to the African World um, Development Bank, um, Af the continent has, and in this respect, I want to really highlight why our partnership with um, Namibia is important in the energy sector. <coughs> Tomorrow we will be having a round table um, on energy and renewable energies, and there will be stakeholders, important stakeholders of the Namibian uh, government and of the private sector, um, and our head, the head of our economic and commercial office, obviously and our ambassador, who are here accompanying me today, will also be participating in this event. And we want to um, help Namibia and to promote the um, renewable energies and also the great project it has of um, green hydrogen, which is obviously a, a vector, which the, the, the whole transformation, our whole green agenda, this is something that's very important that will contribute. Spain is also uh, promoting um, green hydrogen and green hydrogen projects and also uh, could become the same as Namibia wants to become a regional hub. Spain in the future could also become um, a hub for hydrogen, green hydrogen or renewable energies, which we already have a very important um, percentage of our energy mix um, is uh, comes from renewable energies, from wind and solar. 
So this is um, a global issue that's going to determine the future of, um, of a partnership with the African countries, and most particularly also with Namibia, because of the great, strong interest there is in developing the renewable energy sector and the green hydrogen sector. Well, together with um, um, all our um, diplomacy and um, obviously our contribution to peace and security, we have, we're an important um, development partner for the African continent. And as I mentioned before, we have uh, passed a new law on cooperation for sustainable development and global solidarity. And we also contribute through the cooperation within the EU framework. For um, Namibia, in the case of Namibia, we were we had a strong development cooperation until um, 2015 because um, Namibia has become an upper middle income country, and so now we're more focused on the economic sector sectors and contributing to economic development. But um, in our years of cooperation, over 100 million euros were. Uh, disembursed for projects in different areas, in health, in agriculture, in rural development, in fishing, in, um, in education as well. We had um, a, a big dis um, display of uh, projects in many fields, and I think that we still continue cooperating with Namibia, but in a different way because of the status it has now. Um, maybe through um, mostly through financial cooperation and also through um, the in, in this different initiatives that there are in the United Nations, multilateral and a multilateral level. Our third objective would be to become partners to promote Spanish trade, a business presence, and investment in Africa. Now, this is very related to to the previous one, but it's a, a different, a specific priority in itself. And we, um, we have different priority sectors. We have very uh, competitive and state-of-the-art companies that can contribute to um, increase productivity and economic growth in the African countries and in Namibia as well, um, very particularly. Um, we are very invested in agri-food here in, in Namibia. We have projects in the agri-food sector, um, in sanitation, waste management, engineering and consulting, energy, transport, infrastructure, chemical and pharmaceutical industry, and digital transformation. Now, in the case of, um, of Namibia, most particularly, we are very present, as I said before, in the, um, in the fishing sector, for example, and we not only um, are present in products here as well, and exporting back to um, to Europe but to Spain, but we also um, create um, contribute to creating local jobs in the fishing sector. For example, Spanish companies are enabling um, five thousand jobs. For example, direct jobs, but many more indirect jobs as well. And also, um, we also reinforce human capacity and skills because all our companies also have relevant programs of corporate social responsibility for the benefit of the society in which they are integrated. So together with the uh, fishing companies and some of them, such as um, Pescanova, um, contributed decisively at the request of the Namibian government um, the Namibian independent government in the design and establishment, establishment of the fishing sector um, and um, we are still now investing, companies are still investing in the fishing sector and um, opening new uh, factories and uh, processing fish here as well before it's exported back to Spain. Spain, in, 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 from the trade perspective, is the fourth most relevant client of Namibian exports, uh, with over um, 4.6 billion um, Namibian dollars per year. And as I said before, 90% of these um, exports consist of Namibian fish and fishing products that are widely available and very well known in the Spanish markets. And as and the second um, sector which we're very invested in or we want to invest in, um, in Namibia is, as I said before, the energy sector. 
So this is an overview of our economic and trade relations as a whole in, between Spain and Africa. But I think it was most um, interesting for you to really hear about what uh, our companies are doing in Namibia or what they can do. We think that we can contribute to our private sector and with um, the policies from the government and also from our different ministries in Spain and most notably the Ministry of Trade and Commerce with um, approved um, of trade and um, tourism, industry and tourism. They um, has approved the Horizon Africa strategy, which includes a series of financial support measures for the internationalization of companies. Um, that want to carry out projects in, in Namibia or in, in, in different African countries. Um, the African continent, for I think you have to be aware of what you offer to our to companies from abroad. Um, this continent, I don't have to, I think you know better than me, but uh, with a population of 1.4 billion and a rapidly growing middle class, you have a huge consumer market in terms of food, housing, services, education, health, and new technologies. Um, also in the, um, the areas of energy, water, sanitation, engineering, and infrastructure, and obviously uh, agriculture, green transition, and uh, investment potential. And all these are, um, we can make that match between um, our, what our companies would like to invest in and what the, and what the continent also needs and which will also help for the transformation and for the implementation of the African Free Continental Trade Agreement. And lastly, I would like to mention the Global Gateway Africa Europe package, which is a package of the European Union that was announced at the last African Union European Union Summit, and which is uh, a package for to leverage investments in the continent um, in the coming years uh, around uh, 150 billion um, euros. Um, our partnership is also um, has as, an, uh, as a priority to strengthen global public services, health, water, sanitation. I mentioned them before, but I would just like to um, make a particular reference to, as we saw during the, the pandemic, um, the COVID pandemic, the need to reinforce health um, health uh, infrastructure. And we, we also um, cooperated and contributed to the efforts of the African Union and the center, the, um, the disease control center, and 20 million of the 50 million doses of vaccines that were donated by Spain to third countries were, um, were, were given to um, African partners, African countries. We are also partners in humanitarian action. We are well aware of the, um, of the humanitarian situation in many parts of, of the continent. We, we have made a special, uh, special efforts now because of the, um, the crisis, the world crisis, the trillion crisis, the world um, the food crisis, most particularly because of the war in, in Ukraine. And um, also the enormous and the and the drought that um, many parts of the continent are suffering because of um, also the impact of climate change, and um, we are our prime minister in the marches of the General Assembly of the United Nations announced an important contribution um, to address um, um, the, the food crisis, and we're also contributing to the World Food Program to alleviate. The, um, the, um, the serious humanitarian situation was particularly in the Horn of Africa and in, in the Sahel. Um, gender equality is uh, the promotion of human rights, but most particularly gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is something that is very ingrained in all our um, action in, in the continent because we have what we call um, uh, feminist foreign policy, which was um, presented, there was a there was some guidelines that were presented by uh, the Prime Minister in, um, in 2021, and which has different um, priorities amongst an empowerment, economic empowerment of women, promoting the presence of women in political decision spheres, fighting gender violence, 
and um, obviously the respect of uh, human rights of uh, women. Um, we have worked with, with Namibia. Namibia, I think, is a good example, a very good example of uh, women empowerment and, and gender uh, balance in, in many spheres. And we have worked very closely with Namibia in, in the promotion of the women peace and security agenda. We actually promoted with Namibia in the United Nations Security Council the famous resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. And we also contribute with, uh, to the African Union to, to the uh, Audaz, Audaz um, Nepal is the development agency of the African Union. There's a Spanish fund called the Spanish Nepal Fund which is uh, practically um, devoted to women empowerment. And we have just renovated this fund. We're renovating it, and for it will be a new contribution of 20 million euros for uh, new projects in empowering women. Here are the, the basic priorities of our feminist foreign policy. And lastly, um, an important um, objective or priority for us are partners in the management of migration and mobility and to collaborate in the fight against irregular migration and networks trafficking in human beings. Now I would like to emphasize that most of the migra migratory movements take place within the continent, much more than um, Africans trying to go to Europe. Um, just here, um, very close to Namibia, um, you have the case of South Africa which is one of the countries that receive much more, uh, South Africa receives much more migrants than um, the Europe from, from Africa. But um, what we do want to promote is, because Europe, the European Union, Spain needs, um, needs migrants, needs regular, we need regular migrants because um, the job market needs mar migrants and Spaniards, left to other European countries in the 1950s, 1960s, where they couldn't find a job in Spain, and there were other countries where they did find a job. But so this is, um, we want to promote mobility, but in a safe, regular, and orderly way. We have to prevent the loss of lives, and one of the most dangerous, dangerous um, trips that migrants take sometimes are along the Atlantic, um, from the um, African continent, the coast of Senegal and Morocco, to the Canary Islands. It's a very treacherous sea. It's much worse than the Mediterranean, but we, we have all seen the dramatic images and we want to avoid that. And so this is for, for us, um, this is one of our main priorities. And we contribute um, helping the, um, the African countries to also fight against illegal um, um, criminal networks that exploit migrants, and also obviously through development, creating opportunities for um, in, in their own home country. Um, before I go to the last slide that I wanted to highlight, I would like to say that um, during our, the presidency of the European Union, as you know, Spain will take over the presidency of the European Union in, on the 1st of July. We, we will focus, we will try to, we are organizing a high level meeting on transformative investments concentrating on the creation of jobs. So we want to have um, a meeting where we will invite um, ministers of the African countries, but also from European countries to speak about this, um, this issue, because we think that um, the best way that we can contribute or we can help, or we can work with our African partners, are to create possibilities um, and jobs for the for the youth in the continent. And uh, this is one of the great great assets that Africa has that we don't have, and that is the youth. Um, when you think that it, when you you consider that in 2050, in in Africa there will be um, 2.5 billion. Inhabitants and in Europe, it will be in the European Union less than 600 million. So, this is, and, and, and I want to state that 
um, I think this is the most important. Actually, this should really determine because this is obviously, it has to become a demographic dividend. But for that, you have to create the conditions and the possibilities you know, for the, and the opportunities for, for, for the youth. And when I, I have referred to in my presentation, I have spoken to Spain, Africa, obviously Africa, I, I have to maybe try to ex, ex, you know, um, elaborate a little bit. Africa is totally diverse. I mean, we can't speak of, and I think it's, I, I we shouldn't be speaking only of Africa, but I just wanted to say that these are the general priorities of our external policy with our African partners. Now, in some countries, maybe we're more invested in peace and security. For example, in the Sahel, it's obvious because of the situation, the political situation, we are more invested in peace and security and development. In other countries, such as Namibia, um, which is uh, a stable, um, um, country where uh, in rights and, and you know there's always a highlight. It's always one of the examples where freedom is respected and press and and there is um, also women empowerment. We obviously um, are more invested into contributing in, in 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 different ways. And most and I think one of our priorities in the media is to contribute to the economic growth and development of the country now. We don't, we don't have um, development cooperation, but we do uh, have interest. That we want our companies to contribute to the economic growth uh, of the country and to the creation of opportunities and um, for, for the population and obviously strengthening um, bilateral relations. Um, that's why I would like to state that there are differences between one country and the other, obviously. But the general, general objectives in, of, of our foreign policy with our African partners are those. And I'll always, always with um, the total leadership and ownership of the, of the African countries. And they are, they are the African countries are the ones that tell us in this case, Namibia tells us what they would like to cooperate more um, with Spain. Now, there's new fields of cooperation, and for example, with Namibia, we were seeing, we are cooperating also in the fields of sport and culture. We have the famous, we have started um, some projects um, of promoting values through football for young <coughs> and vulnerable populations. There are different schools of uh, football. This is carried by the Foundation Real Madrid. I think Real Madrid is very well known in, in throughout the continent. And we're also cooperating in promoting cultural industries and um, cultural um, uh, exchanges. We would like to also promote the Spanish language and to work with um, Namibia in, in promoting a language which is the second most spoken language worldwide, um, native language after Chinese Mandarin, 500, almost 500 million um, people speak it worldwide. And since I see some stu students, I would like to <laughs> encourage you to, to, learn, um, to learn Spanish. And we also are exploring other areas of cooperation when the um, Namibian authorities tell us that they would like to work in this area or in this field. We are obviously happy to come in and to contribute in, in the best way possible. And one of the things we would like to contribute as well is to promote more academic exchanges between students and also with this new school, diplomatic school and to have maybe young diplomats be able to come to Spain and follow the masters in Spain. And the masters in international relations that we have in our diplomatic school. And um, in this respect, I would like to just show you the map of the um, Spanish language in Africa, where you see over 2 million um, Spanish students in Africa. We have 2 million Spanish students. And, and more than 90% of these students are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And now we have two Instituto Cervantes. Instituto Cervantes is like the Institut Goethe um, for the Germans, or the Alliance Française for the um, for France. And we have just opened one in Sub-Saharan Africa. We had we have some in the north of Africa, but we didn't have one in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we have opened an antenna also in uh, in Ivory Coast. 
and we hope that we will be able to open more and more. But we definitely would like to keep on working with um, with uh, every country in Africa to promote the language and to have more exchanges of students because it's very important to have this people-to-people -people contact, to be in contact with civil society, to be in contact with the youth. I think it's for students to go to Spain and for Spanish students to come to Africa so we get to know each other, each other better. So I think this is more or less an overall view of what um, our general priorities, our priorities, and our, our main lines of action when, and cooperation with our uh, with our African partners are in, and also with Namibia, and most particularly. And um, I think maybe I've spoken a little bit too much, so I would like to leave it there. And if there is any question or any um, observation or remark, I must to, to reply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. My name is Franz, Franz Kolike. I think perhaps what I'm trying to understand from you is, is a, a very good remark that I think I'll be trying to champion from Kenya, Kenyan President uh, William Ruto on the issue of Africa is a continent. Now there's this notion that how do we approach European countries? And he's of the view that we must strive to engage them at the level of AU, at the level of the continent. So that, I, I think for me that's one view that I I'm championing. I'm, I'm now evoking this view to you within the framework and thinking of our partner like, like Spain and the others. How are they receptive to this kind of thinking? Because we, we are pushing so much for the continental integration. And it makes sense if we, we have this kind of project at the level of AU. So I'm trying to understand our partners like in Europe, are they receptive to this kind of engagement? Thank you. Thank you much for that um, detailed and really informative presentation. Um, maybe it's rather a comment, but it's also a question. Uh, you made the reference to Namibia as a mid-income country in the, uh, Spain as a friend of Namibia uh, I'm putting this question to you because personally I come from a, a village in my village as, as we speak they don't have electricity basic things for them to emancipate from poverty and um, of course, if I'm now living in the city of Windhoek, I can maybe agree that um, we could be classified looking at it from Windhoek perspective or major cities, Swakopmund, and all that. But taking Namibia's history into uh, consideration, having just emerged from uh, uh, apartheid and colonialism and all that, which make Namibia. I mean, this is known that we are the most um, the, the most unequal um, uh, uh, country in the world. So, how do we deal with this dichotomy of being at one extreme end? You could say we are highly developed, and at the very majority. We are so ill-developed to a point that my grandmother still go to a, a well and fetch water in her bucket. <coughs> how do we, how do we, I can't, I, I feel like something is moving around my stomach every time I hear this term, um, mid-income country. 
of course we should be praised for, for reaching that level, but at the same time, we are talking about 10% of the population or what? The first one um, concerning the African Union or Africa as a whole, or oh, absolutely. I think that, um, I think the world, first of all, I think the world has changed very much so, and I think it's not an understatement that there is, uh, um, we're in a transition, There's, there are changes, um, the, the world that we knew until now, and then the world order that we knew until now, even though um, we, we defend um, and have, as a basic principle, uh, rules-based order and multilateralism, but there are there are changes, and one of those changes, I think, is um, the important role that uh, Africa is having as a global actor. So it's true. I think it's a different moment, and there's a different. Um, I think in the continent, just the the fact. I know that the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement is going to take time to be implemented, but just the fact that all countries who you know signed that treaty, all the heads of state signed it, and um, except for one, I think it was Eritrea, the only one, no, and it, it's been ratified by many, many um, heads of state. I think it's 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 a very important um, um, game changer, and it really um, kind of um, lets you see that the continent wants to. You know things to change and also to have a greater voice and in the world stage and in world affairs and multilateral fora so um we totally are in favor of um of having together with the bilateral dialogues of having that bilateral that dialogue with the african union as a whole with africa as a whole and um, the European Union, for example, has this partnership with the African Union, European Union, African Union, and they have what we call the joint vision, you know? And I think that um, we should still promote it. And one thing um, does not mean that we cannot strengthen um, bilateral ties with each African country if they want to strengthen it, because this is a two-way, this is a relationship, and so we can offer cooperation, we can offer support, but it's also what the other country wants. But at the same time, we do recognize the important role that Africa has, and um, as I said before, the great asset that it, well, Africa has so many assets. I mean, just the, the youth is one, it's just one, but I mean, just natural resources. There's so many things that the continent has that will determine the future, and not only the future of this continent, the future of Europe, the future of the world. But it's up to the African leaders to really um, know how to manage this, because the responsibility is for, is for the African leaders to start with. And what we can do is to cooperate with them, but you need, but you need good leaders with good visions at this very moment. And um, that links a little bit to what you mentioned, um, Vice Chancellor, about the, um, the paradox of becoming a middle-income country and at the same time suffering great inequalities. And whenever, whenever I speak about um, sustainable development, I always speak about inclusive sustainable development. It's very, very important. And. Um, I have to say that being European in Europe, one of the great assets, even if it's, it has been also um, in, a, um, in a crisis because of the economic situation, economic crisis, but one of the things we had is uh, we have is the welfare state. And it's very important, I think it's important that um, populations do have access to basic services and can feel that they, you know, that they have their basic necessities attended to. So how can we contribute? Well, I understand that um, this, you know, situates countries that were receiving development cooperation and are not able to, but we have to help in other ways. I totally agree. What I, what I consider in any case is that through um, investing in economic sectors and creating opportunities, you know, for the population and creating jobs, then um, this will also help 
you know, the country to have more income to be able to, so what a lot of African countries have, I think, also is they have huge debts. A great part of their, you know, of their income, the budget has to go to pay um, the service of debt and then salaries. So it's um, it's a vicious circle. And with, uh, you know, with the economic situation we have had first with the pandemic, then also with the crisis in Ukraine, it's been one thing after the other. But um, but I do agree that sustainable and inclusive development. Is, is is very important. It's very, very important. And it's the only way in the long run to, you know, to ensure stability uh, and development. Like when, we, when, when I was speaking about the Sahel before, what we try to do is to also work through um, development cooperation and, and try to, to improve the living conditions of the, of the population. Because that, if not that, you know, if that breeds, that fosters that young, vulnerable um, people from the Sahel, for example, or the Horn of Africa and Somalia, will resort to other, you know, to other uh, alternatives, which in the long run are very, very detrimental. So it's it's a, it's very important, and I think that we we have to see how we can still keep on working, and I, I think. I really think we should really strengthen the, um, the economic uh, partnership in that respect and to be able to really bring like investments in that can create, you know, industry and jobs and opportunities. But at the end of the day, the, the responsibility of the policy, implementation and economic governance of the country relies on the government. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I have a question and a comment, but mine is in which I believe that um, a lot of Bolivians are not really interested anymore in the language because there are little or to no opportunities for Bolivians because there are those Bolivians, I'm going to talk about me, who really have the passion for the language. I, am, I have a master's in, in Spanish as a language and its culture. And I want to say is that there are no opportunities for us to teach because of the IFID, um, whereby the Spanish government sends lecturers to media to come and teach. So I want to know what is the Spanish government doing in combating this problem, not to take it away from the Spanish people who want to go and study outside, but what are you doing? What is the government doing to cater for Namibians as well who want to teach, for example, UNA? It's a, it's a great example that they are not taking in the regions because of the IFID program that is uh, providing the Spanish lecturers for the media. The, the door for the media is, is shut. And as much as you would want to be an inspiration, there's just no inspiration story to tell the next media because the opportunity is just not there for us. So thank you. But why is the door shut? Um, for <coughs> Because of the IFID program. IFID, um, I think there is a good. Ah, IFID program. Yes, so the IFID makes it possible for the Spanish lecturers to be sent to the media to come and teach and not be in the media to teach. Not to take away from the Spanish getting the job, but to, to teach Spanish. In the media. Ah, of course, so, but we. Um, do you speak Spanish? Yes, I do. Ah, okay. We, well, we have to see that with our with um, with our ambassador who is here. We already spoke about it because we have some programs that come and um, and work with uh, Spanish teachers. Um, you know, um, Namibians that that teach Spanish as well. So we will look into that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how many. I'm very happy to. And it's great to to meet you because I wasn't sure. I don't know how many. Uh, Namibian Spanish teachers there are, but I think maybe our embassy can get in touch with you and see what we can do. It's uh, you're very important to us, and we will have to support you in every way possible. I agree. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Are there many more? 
I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we would like to have many more. I am um, when in my previous uh, posting, there were a lot of um, there were very very good um, um, Guinean Senegalese. There's a lot, you know, Hispanics that um, teach Spanish. The, in the department of the university, the Spanish language department, and who give lectures, and they, and they they go to also to universities all you know all over the world, and we invite them to Spain whenever there's a congress on the Spanish language, and we invite them. So we'll have to invite you to Spain when we organize something and see how we can support you. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you for the question. Okay, um, thank you. Um, my question is, or my comment rather, is a little bit like Sylvie's. Um, Sylvie and I, we were part of the student that went to Spain to study. Um, she did master's in Spanish, of course, I'm not uh, close to <laughs> her level. Um, yeah, but my comment is more on the uh, young professions. Um, you mentioned that uh, Europe want is this? <laughs> okay uh, want migrants from uh, Africa, but we also have programs where, um, for instance, myself and Sylvie, we went to study in uh, in Spain. Uh, we did programs like did economics, uh, finance, and computation, and whatnot. There are more students, <clears throat> so I think as African youth, what we want to see is that that progressing engagement, not just for us to go study in Spain or in Europe, but also to become young professions that can work. Um, uh, not only in Africa, but also in uh, maybe co in cooperation with, with Europe instead of just going as immigrants we can you we can have that gap covered by the young professions hmm. uh, so when we are taking students uh, or when we are training students from Africa not just to leave them after the, the, the graduation level but rather you know mold them or you train them on, yeah, in that profession and make sure, oh, not make sure, but like also to, you know, give them opportunities in that areas. Um, I think one more thing that I wanted to comment is something that Medeshi mentioned uh, about the um, uh, meeting. Yes, mid income. Yes, uh, because Africa is uh, not in Africa. Namibia is regarded as a mid income um, country. Uh, but one point that Mendesi is mentioning is about the gap between. Uh, I'm not sure if it's called the Gini coefficient. Uh, my yeah. economics is also going, but yes. So it's it's part of that. So I think the cooperation that we want, we want engagement on that. Um, international cooperation to engage on that, to, to, to you know, guide us, not yes, to guide us on how to close that gap or how to go about it. Because it's a pressing matter that has been, you know, uh, on the mouth of the households of all Namibians, maybe not at international level, but in, uh, in Namibia, it's really something that everybody talk about, the gap between the rich and the poor. So these are the things that we need to talk about when we are doing that. We are talking about this cooperation, like uh, how to engage the, for instance, it's like ESG of sustainable uh, sustainability and, uh, yeah, how, how, how to go about crossing this gap. Um, one more thing, I think on that, we want to engage the international cooperation on how, 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 are, they, how, how are they working towards that? Because, uh, and this is now where, how, where, uh, where MIRCO come in. Um, 
we have, for instance, international organizations. And uh, when you work in an international organization as a national personnel and as an, an, as an expert, um, let's, say, let's say, okay, let's say I'm working for an international company that is from Spain, let's say. Uh, the national the, the national personnel, they are packages, let's say, is determined by the the labor act of the country, but the the, the one of the experts is determined from the uh, country where the international uh, international company is coming from. So is the international cooperation contributing to that uh, inequality also so we want these kind of gaps to you know be engaged be you know try to close them and whatnot i think uh yeah that's those are my points from your presentation uh, the first one is that of youth and uh, where you link it to demographic uh, dividend. Uh, yes, uh, the numbers, you uh, almost 60 or more percent in the Namibian population, that's natural. Uh, youth as demographic dividend. Uh, if you look at uh, the rate of illiteracy, that have gone down. You look at school enrollment, uh, that has gone up. You look at the number of graduates uh, from institutions of higher learning. All these are very good elements for demographic David. But they also have the implication of pushing Namibia into the category of a mutual income country. So uh, if the end would have to justify the means, wouldn't it then be logical, not only for Spain alone, but for the organization for economic development, uh, which has set that benchmark of which should be the countries that qualify for it, uh, to, to reconsider that element. Because the way it is now is the means that is justifies the end rather than the other way up. Because with that constraint, uh, it may have implications for the you playing the role of a, a, a demographic dividend. It could become something that would be negative because opportunities would be closed. So uh, I, I think uh, that policy would be coherent if uh, it recognizes that uh, Namibia has moved into this category because it has been making progress or turning the youth into a demographic dividend. So then it should be incentivized. There should be incentives and opportunities. And some of it is what my younger sister there is advocating for. And this could not only be in the form of aid, but especially also opportunities for, for doing business. And, and I think that would help the youth more to, to promote uh, 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 demographic evidence rather than becoming a very because a lot of our young people are uh, becoming very critical and uh, which is good for democracy. Uh, so that criticism should be able to generate and put a case into practice and speak to the help us uh, doing that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, 
I'll be very happy to try and answer your questions. But regarding the the problem of the middle income states, as I said before, I we are we are fully aware of, of the difficulties this poses, and we spoke about what the international cooperation. What can we do more? We we will continue trying to support um, development and economic growth in the country uh, in every mean we can. We will also, in multilateral fora and in the fora where these things are discussed, to see how we can find tailor, um, you know, suited solutions. And we're well aware um, there are many countries in other regions of the world that are in the same dilemma. But it's true that in, in Africa, because the pressure, the demographic pressure is so is so strong, then it's more challenging. So we, we are aware, I will, I will take this back, and it will be just one more reinforcement of, um, to continue trying to contribute to economic growth and creating opportunities, but also being very aware that this is um, something that is uh, very concerning uh, also for the population, no? which is the same way from what you're not what perceiving, you're really um, suffering it. And so it's something that it's, you know, I think I got the, we got the message uh, very clearly and very loud. With regards to, um, but I mean, I don't decide, and you know, it's something that is above me, so. <laughs> but um, with regards to the possibility of students to stay in and completing, yeah, I absolutely, I understand. My, uh, my daughter studied abroad in university, and she stayed there for three years working. She came back to Spain. So I think that mobility of students and young professionals should be something we should uh, muster. And um, absolutely, if you, if you study, for example, in Spain and you find a job in Spain and your company, you know, um, tries to regularize your situation, I mean, I think we should be or you do some kind of um, master's or traineeship. Uh, I do think that if it's something that is attractive and it's, we, we should promote it. Um, obviously, I think the idea is also for students maybe to not stay in Europe but come home back to your country and, and contribute to your country uh, because I think that's the important thing. Know that you, that you get um, your your training or your, but then you come back because your country needs you. You need young professionals and qualified professionals. I think that's very important. But mobility is is is, is something that we should actually promote. I agree. But sometimes, you know, um, it takes time to see all the legal, because also you have to have in mind that the, the Spain is part of the European Union. So a lot of um, decisions are taken within an EU context. They're not done only at a national level. But in any case, when you get a student visa, for example, that is something that is seen as a national visa. And then um, linking to your question, and I would like to give um, uh, or let our head of the economic and commercial office to to come in, but I would just say because they're very technical questions that when I when I spoke before, I mentioned that um, the government um, we have a strategy for policy strategy, but there's also a specific um, strategy for economic and commercial relations. You know, um, in the African continent, and there is a means of uh, financing and international lines of financing for um, Spanish companies or projects, and, and I would like um, to let Isaac Martin Barbero to elaborate on this and, and really uh, answer your questions. But I would just like to mention that um, what you, the example that you said, you know, that you have um, here uh, a company, you've invested here, you have employed local population, I imagine you're producing or you're exporting as well, and um, I think this is what our companies are doing as well, and that we would like to keep on promoting. The possibility of more Spaniards coming to work, I think absolutely that would be no problem. If they find a job and, and it's attractive, I'm sure there, there, there would be no problem. And of uh, qualified or not, uh, I mean, not qualified by the book, as you were saying, no? but people that, um, if a company in Europe, for example, offers, a job to um, to a young Namibian or not so young, but, but considers that it can be an asset for their you know for their company in Spain, they can always you know uh, present a job offer and they can try and um, and process. When I was in Ghana, 
I mean, there were a few, but there were some, um, because there were not that many cases, um, um, visas for, um, that, that um, enabled you to work and, and, and live in, in, in Spain. And that's actually what we would like to promote, you know, safe and orderly migration. And I understand that, I don't think, I mean, the government, it's true that um, sometimes you, you, so visas are rejected, but it's not that you look at the TV, but if there's a serious job offer from a company, why shouldn't it be considered, you know? It, but it has to be the private sector that wants to bring in that qualified person. I mean, it, what, what I think is more difficult is for somebody not just to just ask for a visa, but without a, a certain job offer. But it could be, it's something that can be explored. Um, why not? I think it would be, I totally agree with you that the, and, and that the world has changed and you know, the typical before it was easy to find a job if you studied um, engineering, architecture, whatever. Now we're seeing that the people that find jobs are making a lot of, even a lot of money are people that you know, have creative and innovative ideas, you know, like, um, and that's, uh, so it's, and they have, um, they start startups that are really successful. I, so having a, a career doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do very well. It can open the doors for you, I think, from a personal experience. It can open the doors for you to get certain jobs, that's that for sure. But it doesn't mean that if you don't have, in this world that we live in, you know, with new technologies, artificial intelligence, digitalization, um, it's, it's a totally different world. And I, I can say it as well because I have, uh, I'm a mother of three young, you know, um, kids and, and I can see it. I see what's out there and, you know, what the skills that sometimes they, you know, that, that you need in this competitive world are not the ones that maybe when I went to university, you know, were needed. It's a, it's a very different scenario. But, Isaac, if you can yeah. please uh, answer the most like, technical Question. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. No, uh, very. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I believe you've answered. Uh, 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 all, I mean, most most of the questions, and, and you have certainly touched on, on several of them. But just uh, going back to your question regarding whether certain things produced by a specific company here in Namibia could have a preferential treatment when reaching, um, for instance, the Spanish market. Uh, well, there, there there is a short answer and there's a long answer. The short answer is that's a uh, EU matter and that falls completely within the negotiations that the all, all foreign trade with the third countries outside the EU it's led by by the Commission itself. Actually, it's the very first topic that the Commission at the time took over uh, from national countries. So that's the short answer. Uh, the long answer, and, and also I think it's because it's very interesting that we're having this discussion here at the university and it's raising up many issues of how do you balance uh, a reasonable um, differential treatment with a level playing field? And I think that has come up on, on several questions. So, just to explain the rationale of why that's very unlikely to happen and why is it that we opt for other instruments to try to achieve to achieve something similar to what you are suggesting. Um, the similar instruments is that we, uh, sovereign states, keep the capacity to give certain advantages regarding the elements with which things are made. So basically, we have the right to give preferential financing. Even if you clearly said that you care less about the financing than you care about the market, okay? But, but, but that's how things stand. So we nation states can say, okay, this makes sense, it's a good idea, we want this to, to progress, so we will give um, cheaper financing. But once the, the product is finalized, it needs to access the market in the same conditions as any other product. And that's the way we work, because at the end of the day, if we think about it, that's the way the rule-based order operates. That's what we have things like the World Trading Organization for, because otherwise 
it would become impossible to manage. If we were applying different exceptions, not just to different countries, because, I mean, the World Trade Organization operates under the most favored nation clause. And the exception for that are, as we all know, our regional agreements, okay? But imagine if, if we went for what you somehow are suggesting, if we take it to the extreme, that you had different treatments per company and eventually per product. I mean, maybe someday with artificial intelligence that the DJ was referring to, we'll, we'll be able to manage that. But currently, it's completely impossible. Okay. Uh, but um, we have other ways to, um, to give a head start to certain products, and particularly when, when they're coming from certain places. And, and we can talk about that anytime. Thank you.